Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so as you likely know, um, this today, this morning, for the next couple of hours, we'll be having a really important discussion about the role of Indigenous language um, in the justice system and in Indigenous culture much more generally, as well as some of the obstacles related to uh, access to justice that can be in place for Indigenous language speakers uh, involved in the justice system uh, in this province, province and more generally in this country. Uh, so my name is Sarah Greenfield. I'm legal counsel with the Indigenous Justice Division at the Ministry of the Attorney General. And uh, at this moment, I'll, I'll turn it over to Wasanase, who has graciously um, agreed to be here today to help guide us in this really important discussion about Indigenous languages. Oh, bonjour, miigwech. Wasanase, Indigenous cause, to talk to them. Semani give me the go to Bajayana Manongo to the bottom where I'm going to go. We're going to go where we were in the Shinabia, we're not. We're not going to go where we were in the Shinabia, we're not going to go where we were in the Shinabia. Let's not go into Matabia. We the more can away where we were in the go at Kendaman. Why was it to get people looking what they were in the Shinabia? I JT gonna get it in the old Noki. No go no go go put no go ask gonna get again in Noki. And look to end them gonna get a no Noki man. Kwedas and go in Zaganashim. My name in the language is Wasanese. It means roar of thunder in the language. I also have an English name, it's given to me. Uh, of course, again at birth, we were all given that. Uh, changed over from our traditional names. Uh, my name is Alex Jacobs. Uh, there are a number of reasons how that name came about, but I'm not going to get into that. I don't want to eat up all the important time that we have to answer some of the questions that I know were going to be presented to us up here. But I'm from the Crane clan. I follow my mother's uh, lineage. Uh, although I could have more or less gone on my father's route, but because of my great-great-grandmother telling me how important it was to honor our uh, mothers, that I chose to follow my mother's path as a uh, descendant in, in the Crane language, in the Crane clan. And the Crane clan is, is very important to me. In our language, we call it the Chichak. So I, I want to speak about that later, but right now I just wanted to introduce myself as I have in the language. I've worked with IJD a little over a year now, a year and a half, maybe a little more, and I've been very honored <coughs> to be asked and, and I accepted to be a part of this important uh, group of people that are uh, working with a number of other elders to help guide in uh, some difficult situations where uh, difficulties may present uh, themselves. And uh, we know now the importance that our involvement is to uh, the justice system, especially through IJD, because of the many different uh, um, issues that are presented to us, whether legally or culturally or whatever. So that is uh, a, a, a little bit about myself. I don't want to go into detail about who I am and whatever, but I will say to say that I am a great, great, great grandfather. I had eight daughters and five boys. And of course, like any other family, we've lost a few in our in our times, uh, but uh, more recently I've lost a, a great granddaughter up north and uh, we're still trying to find closure for that. But with all those children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they've given me children, uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and I believe I have four great-great-grandchildren now. 
So we were, were multiplying a number contrary to Duncan Campbell Scott's uh, uh, wish. We're, uh, I'm personally taking uh, hold of that and throwing them aside. We're going to hopefully increase our, uh, our ways, our people. And I see several people here nodding, and some of them I know are from the indigenous communities, and I'm proud to see them, happy to see them here. Uh, I think now I better, I better do what is right. We're, we are in a territory that we are permitted to, uh, to, to use, uh, to be involved in, in this territory for today. So I'm going to stand to honor the land that, that I'm uh, standing on today, to honor the people that, uh, that take care, look after this land and have done so for thousands of generations and uh, are still laying, laying claim to being the, the caretakers of this land. Oh, <laughs> So we will walk again, we're going to go away while we're going to go on. While we can't long go in the snow of the moon, we're not causing people to be no critic. We go to and down this, Mr. Sargas, no credit in the power, we know what we're going to end on the man that 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 we're going to end on the snow of the moon. เอ่อมีเอ่อมิสซาร์กัสเอลจอนคาร์สวัตมีวัดกะเกกะเซมันตัววิโตกุชนานงโกเอ่อมงโกกิเซบวิวิตบาจมวยังนัดมอกะต
will present itself in how you act uh, um, characteristically. You're, you're, you may, uh, as a child, begin to start t uh, showing other babies or children how to do things. You may try and help teach them. And as you get older, in, 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 as a child, sometimes you'll uh, help them in uh, trying to understand what that is or how that, how that is. I can remember when I was younger, I was able to go out and uh, work with a few of my uh, peers, little boys and girls that I grew up with, and I knew the different tracks and different things that these animals ate because of the teachings that my great-great-grandmother and great-great-grandfather taught me. I will call them Dada and Jojo. That's all I ever knew of them when I was growing up. And we lived by a lake, and there was a little marsh and not too far from us. So I used to see all kinds of tracks. And my great-great-grandfather would, would uh, begin by telling me, no, oh, my God, must sit. I'd look in the kienuana, he'd say, he could have, look what's just walked by here. Do you know what that is? No, I don't know what it is. Oh, wabus now. That's a rabbit. Then I see lots of those tracks. Then we'd go around and see other tracks, and I'd see weasel tracks. Uh, I'd see mink tracks. Then once in a while by the river, I'd see uh, uh, Ogik otter. You'd see where they run and then look down the river bank and see where they would go down and he'd tell me what it did and why those uh, uh, signs are there. It would slide down that uh, bank. It was a, a very playful creature. But it was important and all the things that he told me and and taught me were, were done in a language. I knew my language right through till I was about five or six years of age. And uh, I, uh, I didn't know English. Uh, I began to learn it, especially when we start, had to start going to school. So I, I, I was still uh, uh, very much a native child uh, living from the living in the bush, never had electricity, never had uh, uh, running water. The only running water we had was with a young boy running around with a pail of water, getting water for the elders or the parents. <coughs> my uh, <coughs> my first experience in. <coughs> in the school and learning the English language was uh, uh, difficult. The teacher asked me, what is your name? And I, and I couldn't comprehend exactly what she was said. Someone at the back said, "Is the Kazian. And she looked around, who said that? And of course, the young person wouldn't identify. Oh, and I'd say, Nixant, there's the Kaz. Then she grabbed me by the chin and asked me, what's your name? Nixant, I'd say. Well, in our language, Nixant means Alex. It's abbreviated for, uh, uh, translated to Nixant in, in our language. We haven't got as many alphabet characteristics as the lang English language has. So we don't have any L's, R's, Q's, V's, X's, and we don't pronounce the th. If I was to, uh, if I was uh, to, uh, to to talk about a a, um, a a tree that was standing nearby, I can say tree now, but back then I probably would have uh, uh, enunciated as a tree, like the number three, much like the way the French people still pronounce uh, that th today.
we we didn't have that uh, ability to uh, to uh, uh, sound out the words in that in in that way. <clears throat> and then the, the next thing, uh, well, it's going to be very briefly anyway. There was a book she put down in front of me. So anyway, I, I did tell her what uh, what uh, an exant meant because uh, the uh, person, at, the boy at the back, kept telling me, and they, she, he did tell her that it's Alex. So, so um, I nodded my head. So I said, "What's your name?" Alex. Ah, uh, couldn't uh, couldn't pronounce the L, but was close enough. So he said, "Okay, read this. Can you read?" I knew I couldn't read. She says, here, he said, look, 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 see, spot, jump. So she's looking at, putting me down, she's asking me, see that? So repeat. So then she pointed to, look, look, look. So I say, nook, nook, nook. And then she slapped me on the side of the head. She said, no, no, no. And she grabbed my scissors, look at me. So I look away like that, and I'm not staring at her in the eyes or nothing, because we were taught not to stare at people in, in the eyes when you're talking to them. So she said, look. <laughs> I still remember the way the tongue came out to, to pronounce the word. And I, I tried, nook. <laughs> I kept saying, nook, 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 and I couldn't do it. Again, she'd, uh, <clears throat> she'd give me a slap the side of the head and call me the names. But what would have saved time is, is if that she knew some of the native language uh, that we spoke at the time and asked me what I saw on that page. Tell me, what's there? I would have told her, I see a dog trying to jump. There's a fence there. I see a boy and a girl. I see green grass growing there. I see a flower there, which I know now is a dandelion. I see a bird flying way off in the distance. I see a tree in the background. And I see the sun on the horizon and a bird flying. I'd have said all of that. But she didn't ask me that. She just asked me to say, look, 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 see spot jump. I eventually did learn how to say those things, and I did eventually learn how to how to read, but I still had a difficulty in, in pronouncing many, many words. But over the years, uh, with assimilation and, and going to school and going through residential schools and stuff like that, I learned how to, uh, how to uh, read uh, a lot better. But during those years, I, I, I would still go back home and I would converse with my mother, with my aunt, my great uncle, great aunt, great grandmother, and so forth. And I'd still converse with them in the language because those were the things that I understood when they uh, spoke to me and said something to me. If somebody said something to me off to the side in, in a different language, I couldn't understand. But if my uh, grandparents or relatives spoke to me in, in the language, I could understand it. And what I witnessed at that time was that our, uh, our children, the boys and girls that I grew up with, were gradually being assimilated to. They were, uh, be, uh, they were able to speak more and more of the English language. And then as I, as I got older, uh, when I was seven and eight, uh, I started to use the English language quite a bit too, but I spoke a lot in, in the language and, uh, and the, the, the young fellows would tease me and tell them, why, you can't say that? No. I uh, would say, yeah, so I tried, but I still had difficulty, but I mastered it. I can speak pretty good English now. And, uh, but I still know my language. To me, my language was the most important thing in my life in growing up because I heard it from my great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. I lost my father during the Second World War, and that's the reason why I, 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 uh, I spent a lot of time with my uh, grandparents. 
my great aunt, great uncle, great great grandparents, great great grandfather and mother. And if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't have been able to <clears throat> retain the language that I that I did eventually uh, keep in in the year. Uh, it's safe to say that there are still plenty in here that I, I've yet to bring out. Every time I go out to teach, somebody will say something. Well, we say it this way in our territory. We say this. And I think back and I, uh, I say, I don't, I don't remember that word. And then I think, turn out today, then, then it comes to me. The word, yeah, I, now I remembered it. Now I know what it means. But <clears throat> it's, there's a lot still in here that I still have to bring out. And uh, the gray matter up here is starting to match my gray hair, I guess. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know which is getting worse. But my memory is still good. I can remember right back till I was maybe two, two and a half, three years of age things that happened back then, albeit it was a, uh, uh, wasn't a very good time. It was a, uh, uh, a difficult time with our people. There was alcohol involved at that time that I witnessed this event. And then when my, I happened to ask my aunt one time when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, something came up about a junk that she found, that someone found and gave it to her. <clears throat> and I remember that jug and I asked her, oh, gee, I remember seeing that jug. I tell her, I remember when I saw this. When I was a little baby, I said, she says, what is that? So in the language I told her, I saw this jug being tipped over was by a man. It was a half gallon of, uh, of uh, wine, I guess, because it was uh, grape colored, red. And there was another man with him, <clears throat> and they were arguing. And he turned around and hit him with the jug. I don't know if he meant to or not, but the jug broke open, and there was red all over the snow and all over the ground and along his face, and I didn't realize that he had been uh, injured so badly. But my father broke, I remember my father going there and breaking up the fight and settling things there. And while in the meantime, I was in this box in the sleigh that he was, that he was pulling me in. And he was talking to them in the language. He was uh, um, asking them why what are you fighting for? And all, and it had to do with that jug. So my early experience in life with, uh, with, uh, with that jug tells me that I'm still involved with it today. Not in the same sense, but what it produces. It's produced a lot of uh, difficulties in our, in our families, in our lives. That's why you were all here. You're all becoming lawyers and crowns and judges and whatever. And eventually you're going to uh, uh, be presented with a case that involves one of my people, some of my people. And in some cases, many of our people from different communities. And most of it's going to be all alcohol related. I can sit and talk with many, many of my elders in any community I go to, and I can ask them, you can done the piggy costume I ask in the language, do you remember when you were a child? What are the things that you most remember? God, you have it, you know, what happened? And they talk about the times when when there was alcohol in the in the in the community and the destruction that it caused. And in our line of thinking as elders, we all agree that it's, it's the same thing that's happened to our people. And uh, it, 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 it hasn't uh, uh, 
slowed up all that much. It, uh, it's got, it reached the point where uh, uh, so many of us became uh, uh, addicted to it. I too was for a period of time. And even after I got out of residential school, it, it made me uh, even more, uh, uh, I guess, dependent on it because it, it relieved me of a way of suppressing the anger and the hurt that I felt because of what I endured while in that place. And I, I would think back of all the things that, that, uh, that transpired there, and I would think about it in my language. I could relate it to you all in my language of what I remember, what happened, and how things transpired, and the people that I met. Some of the more important people I met back then were the people that helped me from committing or doing something that would have seriously uh, uh, changed my life from an early age. And that was a, a man that was much older than me. Uh, he was probably about 14, at least three years older than me, four years. He was, his last name was Munias. Him and his brother came from way up in northern Kenora region. And because they, they uh, were young and had to be sent to school, they, they also ran away from the schools that they were sent to. Cecilia Jeffries, for example, uh, was one of the schools they ran away. And because of the uh, crime they committed when they had run away, they got to Kenora trying to get home. Uh, they uh, uh, they found out that their relatives were uh, were coming out of this place, and they were drinking, and it was causing a lot of problem with the family. So they burnt the place down. And, uh, and, uh, what happened was they got they got uh, charged with it, and they wound up being in the same school that I was. I don't know how long they spent there, but where they went after they left, uh, left the school, but uh, they, were, they were there. And with his advice of things that I was going to do, I, I didn't. And I can be thankful that I listened to someone a few years older than me back and then, back in that time, and he spoke to me in the language we did, uh, although we couldn't speak openly out in the playground or outside of class, or in class, because we were prohibited from using our language. But we always found ways of trying to uh, to speak our language, and, and uh, many of us spoke to ourselves. I know I did. I talked to myself a lot. I think about things. And but when you this well was it scared. If this were to happen, what would you do? And I would think. I would try and think of the more difficult things uh, that would happen in my life, and that way it would bring in words that I, I uh, really weren't accustomed to growing up with. It would be something that I heard, uh, like the, the, the term to, uh, like, uh, diversion. Uh, I would use these things in my mind. Right? How would I say that? So I think of ways of how I would say it in relation to how the language is related to uh, to uh, to everything. This here is a cup. My language is we call it minikwagan. Some people call it nagans. The reason why I was told it was a manikwagan is because what's in there is something you can drink. And it's a vessel used for drinking. So I, uh, I, I'm, our language is very descriptive. Today we got this, many of us. I think I, I know for a fact that we all have this. And years ago, it used to be one of those things you crank in your dial, and it would come through this. Now this comes through the air. What we called it back then is gigdo, 
be what once it was known as the talking wire. And I used to think, how can wire talk? Didn't realize. And then we, as children, we'd, we'd all experiment. Of course, we got tin cans. We put a string through it and put wax and then we talk and you could actually hear what the other person was saying at the other end. I guess that's what Alexander Graham Bell probably found out too. Maybe he got it from an snobby you <laughs> who, who's to know. That's that's progress and that's time. Now we're at a time here in in, in, in our lives where Everything is important. And to us, my language is important. To my people, the language is important. When you go to court and you have to talk to someone and you're trying to tell that person that, well, this is what's going to happen. But you not being able to speak that in the language, you may have to translated with someone else, like someone like maybe Sarah will uh, tell my uh, tell the person that we're in the court with, I'm able to translate to him. And she tells me and I, uh, and I tell him that, well, this is what's going to happen. Um, if this is what you did, if this is what you did, this is what's going to happen. It's important that you speak the truth. You gotta say what's true. So we talk about that, and in many of our courts that we have today, they have a book that's beside the uh, beside this box. And nowadays we have the feather that's uh, provided for us. And we're asked, how do you uh, choose to affirm what you are going to say or respond to? Uh, do you wish to use the Bible, the feather, or to affirm? And of course, most of our people in Shnave who believe in our cultural ways will grab the feather and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll uh, say, what they have to say in, in, in the language. Uh, we're taught to say that in, in the truth because this is the representation that we have that connects us to the great spirit. On the other hand, this one here is, <coughs> is a book that has been translated from many, many generations and different cultures and uh, spiritual beliefs that they ask you well, hold this in your hand and uh, tell her say what you need to say that everything you need to say is the truth and nothing but the truth well if that person was there and was, didn't know for sure what what to uh, how to respond if he took this he could hold it in his hand and the, the, the court would probably, uh, well, they would assume that he's going to tell us the whole truth, nothing but the truth. In reality, he could tell you a bunch of lies. He could tell you things that, that really didn't happen. He could say, no, well, not really, no. Because most of the times you have to answer yes or no. He could say no. But on the other hand, if he was asked in the same manner, and he was holding this, he would, he would respond accordingly and say exactly what it is that he's there for. I'm not saying that the, the, either one is a cop-out, but I'm, what I'm saying is that's how important our culture is to us, to know that this piece of... of uh, of the uh, bird that we rep that we recognize is that important to us that we will say what is the truth. And many times, because it is the truth, and if we say the truth, many times we're uh, uh, 
will get convicted because we did say the truth. Uh, I know there are, uh, I've watched many, many cases on, 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 on the boob tube where words are put into the mouths of, of the defendants. And they're saying, the, word, the lawyer or whoever is saying, you did this, well, now to that, now you answer yes or no. Now you got no choice, you got to answer either yes or no. You can't explain as to what really happened unless your lawyer, your defense will bring it up later and translate it in to you in a way that you better understand it. And sometimes it'll go from the lawyer through to the, the uh, uh, through to the person that you have with you as your interpreter, and then that interpreter will will uh, will uh, translate it into words that you better understand. So, uh, in in that sense, it it tells me that that how that's how important it is. In this, in this uh, uh, judicial system, that we have an understanding of language, the importance of it to the people that are being uh, charged with whatever that are in court, people that are there to uh, to uh, uh, translate for the individual or support, that their words be understood that their words be taken as, as, uh, uh, as if it had been spoken on this book when they spoke. So I know people that would hold this in their hand and they would tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And they would not think of lying about it because they have a firm belief in their spirituality. Much like the people that I've met in later life I met the Dalai Lama about quite a few years ago, and he taught me, he told me things about myself that I'd forgotten, but he knew about me. I've met others who come from different faiths, faith, faiths, or whatever you call it, and uh, uh, how important it was for them. A man gave me a little book one time, I started to read because I can read English now, I thought, well, that's really, really good. Something like what we believe in. And the book that he was reading, that little booklet that he was uh, 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 reciting from was from the Quran. Later, about eight, seven, eight years later, he brought me a big book, it's about that thick. He gave it to me as a gift. And he said, you know, I honor the way your people uh, have respect for, for their spirituality. And I read about spirituality and how they speak among themselves, how they speak when they say the truth. He said, and I was impressed by that man in the government. His name was Harper. He took the feather in his hand and with one word, he ended to meet like a court. And he said, and he said no to whatever was being presented. He said no. And because of that, because of the importance of what that meant to him, what that would have meant to our people in terms of our language, retention, or cultural ways would have affected us greatly. And he said no. And we can thank him, I guess, well, we can thank him for the things that we have uh, preserved over time to this day. <clears throat> we have times when we uh, were called to, to go testify or support someone in court. And sometimes I, uh, I'll go there and they'll ask the individual some questions and he's not sure of what is being asked of him and uh, uh, he'll ask me, what is it they're asking of me? So then I'll ask the, uh, uh, the person, usually it's the crown or prosecutor or whoever, 
Uh, could you repeat that? So he'll repeat it, and then I'll say it as best as I can verbatim to the individual. This is what he said. And in some ways, sometimes the words that we translate are not, you're not able to uh, translate in the language. We come as close as we can to, uh, to identifying that, what, what is being spoken in the language in order to make this person have this, not make him, to have this person understand. Because that's what justice is all about. They have to know, they have to understand totally what it is uh, that they're for and why you're there speaking for this individual. And to me, justice is all about that. And that's why I'm here. I have to try and explain to you and uh, in ways that I can so that you can understand the words that uh, oftentimes are spoken in court and that you need to, uh, that you want to understand. I, uh, uh, I'm thankful that many of our people that uh, uh, are working today are uh, graduates from different uh, schools of thought, and many are now lawyers. I hear uh, even in my community, we have, a, uh, we have a, a chief now who is a lawyer. I never thought we'd have a chief that, was, that will one day be a lawyer. And she is a chief in, in uh, Atikamek, she. And her English name is Rishi. But she comes from the same family that my great grandfather came from on the same side. That's the Pedadogos family. She comes from the same family. My great uncle Paul is from that, that's her family. I never ever thought that that would uh, ever happen. But we have that. Now we have other members in our community that are uh, uh, going to become nurses, doctors. Many of them are uh, also pursuing other professions as engineers. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that the ones that that are there are now learning to, to, to uh, uh, find ways to preserve the language, to teach the language. I see one student uh, that I had here that's in this classroom with me, in this classroom, in this room with me right now, who, uh, who was in many of my classes that, that I, uh, I taught here in Toronto. I've, I've taught here for over 28 years since graduating from Lakehead University. My teacher was Lena White. My elder was Fred Wheatley. Uh, one of my students, she's right here right now, and her name is Rochelle. Uh, I call her Rochelle, but I know she has a, a native name too, but uh, I'm not sure I remember it uh, properly, and I don't want to mix up the name and call her something else and might get mad at me, angry with me. But <clears throat> she's here today and now she also is a teacher. She teaches the little ones. And that's where our language has to really begin with the little ones all the way up. She's teaching in her own way, from the way I taught, phonetically, how it sounds. I hear her trying to talk to the little ones or hear her speaking to others. Try it this way, say it this way. And she'll read stories to them or they'll watch little videos. Well, I, I too have had a chance to start using videos, but uh, mine are, are more about the, the difficult times we had like in uh, in the, in the schools, like the, where the spirit lives. That's about residential schools and the impacts of it. 
and the uh, 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 trauma that we endured, the, uh, the uh, intergenerational uh, impacts that uh, are uh, uh, presented to us today. For me, uh, I, I haven't had the opportunity, I haven't had the, uh, I won't call it opportunity, I haven't had the need to be going to court to have a lawyer represent me. I've been able to stay clear of that uh, ever since I uh, gave up on my uh, drinking days. But I've been there several times to assist in trying to help others get through their difficult times. And that person that's helping <clears throat> the individual is called Nadamal Geonini. Nadamal Geonini is like, in, in our language, is the helper. And Nene means man. Nadamal Geonini. But we also say, Nadamal Geonini Kwe. Funny how we always have man involved in there. But it's, uh, uh, and to, to make it even uh, more difficult when you understand it. If we want to talk to, say, about a nurse, we say, shkikyu nini kwe. That's a nurse. But yet we got nini in there? Why do we have that? I don't know. That's something that I hope we'll eventually uh, just say, shkikyu kwe. We have that in our language when we identify a woman that is of the Medellin society. Our language is important in, in, uh, in our cultural ways because the Medellin society is, is a society much like the Orange, much like the, the uh, Knights of Columbus, much like oh, whatever. Uh, they have their, well, you might call it idiosyncrasy, but they have the importance of ways of communicating with one another. While in our way, with the, with the Medellin, we, we teach about the importance of what this means to us, the importance of tobacco and how this always leads the way to whatever we want to do. And then, it's presented in a way, too, that you have to use the language. I wish I could just sit here and talk in a language, because that's what wants to come out, and that's what I feel needs to come out. But I also know that there are some of you sitting out there that have words in your mind that you're thinking of, well, how would I go about helping someone who has this particular kind of uh, uh, situation we have to deal with in court? Well, the only way we can uh, resolve that is try to find out how would you go about saying those particular words? Well, you have to learn that. Some of the ways that you can learn to do these things are, are uh, are, are not easy because it took us how many years, 500 years from the time of contact to where we are now, to where I am speaking to you in the language of our, our colonizers. All that time, how long is it going to take before I can hear my great, 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 great grandchild if I live that long, that's four generations. Well, well I'm over halfway there. <laughs> Hear them say, and in that, he would be saying, hello, grandfather, how are you today? Am I ever going to be able to hear that two gener three generations from now? I can hear it now, two generations, but very minimal, not everyone. Not all my great-grandchildren are able to uh, come through with the language. In some of our other communities further in the north where you, many of you work or have worked or will work, they speak the languages up there too that uh, uh, differ from how I say things because we have 
a community that lives further north, that is of the Cree community. And then we have the people from down below that area, which is the Ojibwa. I don't say Ojibwe. That's a, uh, an English word. I say Ojibwa. I speak Ojibwe. That's the language I speak, Ojibwe. I'm an Ojibwa man. I'm not Ojibwe. Ojibwe is when somebody's running away, Ojibwe, go now. Oh, oh, that person is running away. They're not running away. But it's Englishized words. But that person, those people that are up there, they speak Cree, people down below Ojibwa. And there's a group in between that have increased in numbers because of the interaction that they have with their communities being so close to one another. And then the woman marrying the Cree man up, from up north or the Cree or the Cree man marrying a Cree woman from up north and in exchanging conversations and then words are are spoken and they say it a different way. So what have, what has uh, evolved is uh, is uh, 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 actually I guess a new nation that's called Uji Cree. Uji Cree. Many of you have been I don't know, maybe, maybe not, maybe uh, many of you are just too new as lawyers. How many of you have been in, uh, in Oji Cree country? Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, seven, well, that's not bad. Seven out of 20, that's one third. How many out you out there? <laughs> <laughs> supposed to be televised, I guess. There's probably a few, uh, but you'll notice the difference between the languages there. And it's up there where you need to uh, have a better understanding of what language means to them. I can speak for me as an Ojibwa man, but I can't really speak for the person that's coming from up north as a uh, Meshkigo, as a Cree, Cree person. I, not, I would not be doing justice for those people if I tried to try to give you words that you can use with them as uh, uh, in your work. Because I'm not Cree. I understand a few, uh, quite a few words, and I know quite a few people that come from up there, from Moosonee, uh, Attawapiskat, and uh, all these different places. I have uh, elders that I work with that, that come from near that area up in the Treaty Tree and uh, other areas up north. And even within those little differences that we have in our communities, there are, there are ways that we say words that are a little different. When we have a gathering of elders here in the city, I am usually honored with having to say an opening prayer or even a blessing for the food that we're about to share that day. And now the elders from up north will say, will ask what son is say, because this is his territory, this is the area he's from, and this is the language that they speak here. Well, when we go up, when we reciprocate, when we go up north, we're gonna go to their territory. They, in turn, I'm speaking of Gilbert and others up north that uh, come from that. Uh, Saul Day, people I know that I work with through the, uh, um, the TRC. They would say their uh, uh, welcome in, in, the, in the way they would say in, in their dialect. Ojibwa language is, is very, uh, very uh, different. Uh, we have, uh, just in Ontario, we have uh, several, di several dialects. I can go to uh, Serpent River and listen to someone speak there, and I know where that person is from. I can come down the road to the Espanola turn off and listen to someone speak there. I know that person is from Birch Island, just by the way they speak. Or someone else you know, talking to the person on the other side. I know that person is from Sagamuk, just by the way they speak. 
And then if someone on the other side says, Onishna, I know that person's from Manitoulin Island because they say, uh, 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 pronounce words in a little different way. For me, in the, on, uh, I, if I'm going to ask someone how, how they are feeling, I, I would say, Anish Ezeyayan, how are you? Uh, from from the island, we hear mostly, Anish Ezeyayan. Well, to break that down literally, it means, how is it that you are living? Bimadzian is living. Anish is what or how. Oh, how are you living? He's not asking me if I'm out there panhandling or working on picking shovel or cutting trees. He's asking me how my life is. Anish is Madsian. How is Anish is Ziyaya? And they've shortened it uh, to say Anish Na. So we, we all know what that means now. And I can ask my people in my area because they're used to hearing that now, and it's sort of taken hold in many communities. Anishna. So we know what's being asked and what's being said. Uh, it's like you saying hello, or greetings, or hi. They're all understandable. But when you go sitting down in a courtroom with uh, the man and the, or woman in the black robe and with the uh, gavel there and he's waiting to hear what is being said there or the person there is waiting to hear what is being said and with the two defense and the prosecutor trying to make heads or tails of the case he's trying to come up with a decision that'll help this person that's being uh, presented before him and he needs to know that this person that's before the court has an understanding of what is being said to him and about him. And likewise, he in turn <coughs> has to, this person also has to understand what this individual is saying and what the understanding is of what he knows of what is happening. Because many times the judge says, do you understand? And sometimes I have to tell them, I have to say, Kanistatana, do you understand them? And you know, sometimes he's a bit hesitant, uh, Bungi, a little bit. Me go on away, or with different responses. So the language could be very uh, in that way. Uh, but if you ask him to say it to, uh, uh, to say it just in either yes or no. If you ask them in the language, you had, he had the feather. With the most shit, me no no gosh you have it. Me go get ka. He'll tell you, eh, get or ka ka win. He'll say yes or no to you in that way. But if he's given an opportunity to. Uh, 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 to explain a little more, which I think should be, should be allowed, but it, it isn't, uh, to explain a little more. And I think, because I think we're trying to get through these uh, uh, sessions much quicker, so a lot of words are not uh, being spoken. Uh, a lot is not being said. Therefore, many of uh, the issues are not even known to the uh, prosecutor or to the to the defense until after it's, the case is over. Then the defense is saying, well, had I known that before, I might have been able to say something else. But I don't know what happens then. But once you're, you're through court and once that's finished, you can't take that person back to court or you can't uh, try him again. I understand there are different levels of uh, double jeopardy or whatever they call it. So I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I, uh, uh, I think I've spoken quite a bit here. I, I would like to answer a couple questions if I can, if there is anything in particular that 
you might want to uh, ask of me while I'm here. Yes. Uh, maybe I should say um, Actually, I'm going to promote a register of the Superior Court of Justice, which is just connected to this building. So I sit in on the criminal proceedings. Will you deal here? <laughs> yes. Um, so um, we sit in on criminal proceedings. I have been doing so for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I've done with thousands of trials, jury, non jury, that kind of stuff. So I've seen thousands of counsel. And it's, uh, it struck me that I can count on one hand the indigenous judges I know, Justice LaForme, Justice Deshaun. Mm -hmm. And defense counsel, I don't know any of uh, indigenous background, and I know two crown attorneys that are. So in terms of access to justice, is there something that we can do to encourage uh, young indigenous youth to get involved and become lawyers and become crowns and become more active in the justice system? Because to me, it seems there's such a disparity. I think I heard that once before <clears throat> from another uh, uh, judicial person. His name was Steele. He was uh, presiding in a case in, in, a, in a far north, and he himself stated at that point that, that we were traveling all these many different miles going back and forth to try people that... Uh, that uh, many of them don't understand what is being presented to them. What they needed was to be able to have that court or in their areas where they could understand. And better still, to have people of their own, uh, uh, I guess their own race, I don't know what he said, but I remember something to that effect, that to have them be able to speak to, to the people in, in that way so they could understand. And what you've just described to me, and from what I understand that some of this, uh, well, this is going online, that those that are now uh, going through uh, 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 law schools and about to start doing their articling, if that's the term they use, heard just what you said and know exactly what they need to do in order to make this happen. I remember meeting, I don't know how many times I came here, I met Judge Harry LaForme. I was here the day he was, he was uh, made, uh, uh, brought to the appellant court, was it? Yeah, he's gone to the court of appeal. Yeah, I remember when he first came here. And then I remember when I came back here another time, years later, when he was given the talking stick. And the man that gave it to him there spoke about the importance of what this item meant to him and from his people in his language. And he accepted it because to, to this man that, uh, that presented it, knew how important it was to have an indigenous man sitting in the position that he was about, that he was in. And how important that was, as you just indicated also. And then I was here again a month ago when we honored uh, his honor, uh, Harry LaForme, in, in wishing him well in his uh, retiring from, from being a judge. In fact, I sat at the table downstairs uh, in this room where we had the meeting. Uh, I sat with many LaFormes. Mm. I felt like a LaForme. <laughs> there were so many of them. I met his brothers. I met his wife. I think it was Jan and, uh, and several others. And I didn't realize that there were others there that, uh, that, were, that have indigenous blood in their, uh, in their family. Another one that I've been here for uh, quite a few times is uh, Susan Hare. Do you remember, do you know Susan Hare? I'm sure some of you must know her. She comes from Manitoulin Island. And I believe she was, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a JP, a judge or whatever, but she uh, was for sure a lawyer. And I met others. I also met, uh, uh, what's her name, from way out north of west, uh, uh, De uh, Dele uh, Delia of uh, 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 Pepecue. 
you know, Adelia Pepecu, her, and I've, I've met other, other uh, uh, people who were, had indigenous blood in there. Now I have a relative who is a lawyer, and she's also chief of uh, my community in, in Whitebush Lake. And I'm sure she's trying to uh, tell the people the importance of, uh, uh, of her position in hopes that others will follow in, in her tracks in what we do, what we call bimikoe. We leave tracks, we leave footprints as to how we live our life and things that we do. I've met you several times uh, throughout the time that I've been around, and I know of you, I've heard of you, and there are other peoples that, uh, people that I've met, and I, I am happy to say that the words that I heard from them were equally as pleasing as what you've just said and encouraging. And if any of you out there have the inclination to become lawyers, well, you have that chance. Maybe you can encourage others because it's needed. How else can we do anything with our, with our people, for our people, if we don't have the representation uh, to do that? I saw the sign over here at the corner of the building and it stated something like that all people have the equal right to be fully represented by the law. And that this for the law of all people, that it's equal. Well then, why can't our people recognize that they have to get involved too to become either lawyers, uh, uh, judges, well I guess you have to be a lawyer first, <laughs> to become a lawyer and to help, help other people, to help, help them understand <coughs> what it is we need to, uh, to do to help the situations that we are involved in and in a peaceful, uh, judicial way. If I can just add one thing. Yes. Um, I'm cognizant of this sort of very grand but very colonial room that we're sitting in right now um, in the presence of an Indigenous language speaker and teacher. Um, and I'm grateful that the Law Society of Ontario has invited us to be here and that we have this opportunity to hear from Wasanase um, and hear him speak the language in this room, which in many ways is sort of a uh, representation of all of the attempts at colonization, attempts at assimilation that have um, resulted in a weakening in many circumstances of Indigenous culture and Indigenous language. But I think that conversations like this, in rooms like this, invitations put forward by organizations, by bodies like the Law Society of Ontario, are so important in terms of um, encouraging and sort of facilitating Indigenous people to be involved in a positive way in the justice system, becoming lawyers, becoming judges eventually. Um, there is such a deep mistrust between Indigenous people and the government and specifically the justice system because of all the incredible, unquantifiable harm that has been inflicted um, on indigenous people and communities. And so part of what needs to happen if there are going to be more indigenous lawyers, because I know, I, know, I mean, I've looked at the stats as well, um, is conversations like this, um, programs like this, Wasana they mentioned the Mikawe, which is um, for lack of a better description, an indigenous uh, cultural competency training, which we don't like to call it that, but um, that uh, the Indigenous Justice Division at MAG has the mandate to facilitate specifically for justice sector OPS workers. Um, if that kind of training and, and word um, spreads about that kind of training being mandatory, available for justice sector workers, for judges, for lawyers, um, if there can be sort of uh, the spreading of an understanding that um, that harm that has been inflicted by the justice system, by the government on Indigenous people is not only being recognized, but the truth is being put out there and attempts to educate um, both within the justice system and generally the Canadian population, that those are out there and, and meaningful. I think that that's a, a really important step. 
Um, I'll just really quickly speak to the Indigenous Justice Division. We are 80% um, Indigenous, our staff. We're very small, we're only about 25 people, but I'm one of the few non-Indigenous staff who work there. And we have the mandate of, of helping to repair the relationship between um, Indigenous communities, Indigenous peoples, and the justice system within this province. Um, as far as I know, we're one of the very few divisions of its kind throughout the country. Uh, we, ha we have an uphill battle. We have a hard, a really, really difficult job. Um, but also the uh, creation of similar divisions, I think, um, in different levels of government and throughout the country with the specific mandate of, of attempting to repair that relationship, I think is also really important. Um, the, the harm that has been imposed needs to not just be recognized, but needs to be talked about in a very open way. And uh, again, I think conversations like this and opportunities for um, people like Wasana say to speak in rooms like this, I think are really important and a, a really important step at least. Thank you. Wasana Thank say. you. Well, and again, <clears throat> she just uh, uh, reminded me that in our in our uh, in the agency in the um, agency that I'm with, uh, IJD, we have uh, another very important person that's connected with the judicial system, and that's uh, Kimberly Murray. She's a uh, she's uh, a Mohawk. So that's another indigenous person that isn't. A pretty high level of, of uh, judicial uh, uh, division, but w like you say, we do need a lot more, and uh, hopefully, uh, that's going to uh, continue to happen. I remember when I came here; one of my other contacts was uh, Marisha. She used to be here a lot. She used to bring me in when we would have the convocation of. Uh, elders, be I mean, uh, elders, uh, uh, lawyers, graduating uh, from from the, from law school, we'd go down to the uh, to the Thompson Hall, and I'd be up there, and I would give their certificates to the indigenous uh, uh, lawyers that were graduating. I don't know how many we've done over the years, but. There was quite a few. I'm sure if you check with Marisha or the person that's taken over from Marisha, they could give you a better count as to how many lawyers we do have that have graduated through this particular school, through Osgoode and other law schools in, in, uh, throughout Ontario and Canada. Uh, we have uh, another staff member who graduated from Victoria, BC, yeah. She's a lawyer and she's an indigenous person, uh, albeit it's, uh, I guess, 50 uh, 50. 50 50. Eh? 50, 50 she's yeah. indigenous. She's Metis or whatever you want to call it. But anyway, she, she, uh, she's proud to say, uh, 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 testify. I mean, she's proud to uh, uh, testify to her. Uh, 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 indigenous uh, blood from her family. So I know that uh, uh, each year there are a number of other graduates coming about and I'm just uh, like you wondering how many of them will eventually move on to become crowns or eventually will become uh, judges. And I'm hoping that one day that will happen Maybe one day someone will be up there in the Supreme Court. Who knows? That would be a... Yes? So my name is Wendy Agnew. I'm the Senior Indigenous Justice of the Peace for the Ontario Court of Justice. And uh, while I believe that there should be uh, more Indigenous lawyers, uh, there are a lot of Indigenous people on the bench that are not lawyers. On the Ontario Court of Justice, there are approximately 350 justices of the peace at this time, and 37 of those uh, justices of the peace are indigenous. Uh, I believe four of them are retired, but work per diem. And of the 37, I believe seven are, in, including myself, are lawyers. But uh, it's difficult sometimes to tell 
whether somebody is indigenous or not indigenous. Sometimes it's in their mannerisms, in the way they speak, um, and how they acknowledge individuals in the courts, um, in other circumstances um, in the GTA. It's not always uh, as apparent because uh, we deal with indigenous and non-indigenous matters. So if his honor the form were dealing with a matter that was uh, not an indigenous matter, um, his indigeneity may not come to the forefront of him being the presiding judicial officer. So um, I certainly would encourage anybody who is indigenous that is interested in becoming a justice for peace to always take a look at the website to see whether or not there are opportunities uh, for justice of the peace, but also for anyone who has indigenous background as well because it is important that we have representation in every community across the province and in every region. So uh, just something to consider. Thank you. Thank you. That is another uh, 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 piece of information that is really good to hear. In terms of numbers, I'm, I'm, I'm good. it's good to hear that. And, and I'm sure that over the next uh, years to come, those numbers will increase. Yes. I was just wondering if you could recommend some good ways to uh, learn the Ojibwe language. Have you watched, uh, yeah, you've watched TV quite a bit lately. <laughs> <laughs> There's a program that, that came out not too long ago, and it's called... Uh, the APTN it, program? It's an APTN program, and uh, a 28-day program. First contact. First contact, that's it. Well, that might be something that where you can begin. The feature, the film, fe the uh, the uh, episodes feature individuals. There's a number of people there that uh, are taken out from different members of society, go to different communities, all having had negative attitudes or uh, understandings about native uh, about indigenous people. So they go there, they join these groups, and after going from community to community and evolving uh, over a period of time, they begin to understand the difficulties and the ways of life that the people ha are living. And at the end, I'll just go that, that at the end of it, after the 28 days, they're reviewed again, they're interviewed, and asked what they thought of, of what they've learned over the, over, the, uh, over the 28 days. And from the episodes that I've seen, I've watched it, I was astonished to see the change in attitude that these people had in terms of their understanding of the cultural ways that, that people have. And, and have lived. And some have indicated that they have uh, an, an indication even wanting to learn more of the culture and the language. The language is really uh, uh, available to many, many, uh, to anybody. Some of the most uh, 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 successful people that I've ever uh, uh, taught were non-native. I remember being in, in uh, Thunder Bay at this school, uh, Lakehead University. We were there for four weeks, every summer for four years. So this one year I was there, um, and th these young students had been there also going for three and four years. And every one of them get up at the end of the uh, summer and they graduate and they want to thank the school and thank the community that come from and wherever for allowing them to come there to learn the language. And a lot of the young people that are there are indigenous. This one time this young girl gets up there, she acknowledges people, she's got blonde hair, blue eyes, very European, probably a, a Swiss, Finn or somebody, uh, anyway, very Caucasian. She gets up to say, ah, miigwetz, miigwetz again, in the gibbishaya nama. Jibbake nama niho, jin shnabe manan. Miigwetz again, maba kinomagyo ninuk, ga kinomagoyan jin shnabe manan. 
I'm listening to her talk. She spoke for about 15 minutes, giving thanks for the ability, for the uh, uh, chance to be able to take part in this uh, language class that she attended. And she spoke so eloquently that, well, I had no choice. I had to stand up and applaud her. And all the other elders that were in the building applauded her too because she was, she spoke so eloquently and really, really uh, uh, knew what she was saying. So if a, a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old child can do that over the course of four weeks per summer, I don't know how much time she spent away from it after, after the school, after the summer classes, but I'm sure she endeavored to really try and learn it. That if someone at that age can do that, I'm sure that if you have the desire to want to learn that, you can do that also. One of the ways I might recommend is if you go up north and if you have the time, find out from an elder, uh, uh, a family of elders that speak and practice the culture. If you could share the, some time with them to learn the ways of the Anishinaabe people whether it be Cree, Oji Cree, Anishinaabe, or whatever. Ask them if you would, they would do to you the honor of, of helping you understand the language and culture. And I know if you're there for a period of time, maybe six months, eight months, I don't know how much time you've got, <laughs> but you would learn, you would learn an awful lot. And uh, uh, if we, if, if, if it took me uh, two years to learn the English language, I'm sure in two years you could learn to speak the Ojibwa language too, if you, I don't have to slap you on the side of the head. <laughs> I wouldn't do that anyway. But anyway, that's, I'm sure you'd be able to uh, learn. In fact, we have uh, online classes now. Isidore Toulouse is a good teacher. He was one of the teachers that I went to school with, and one of the first, one of the people that I took over uh, his classes here in Toronto 30 years ago. So he's still teaching, and uh, I have many students that I've worked with over the years, and I think at least 10, 12 of them have gone on to become teachers themselves. One of my one of my students that I'm proud to say is a young woman who teaches up in uh, uh, York University, May uh, Chakobi. She teaches the Ojibwa language. And uh, uh, I'm up in Sudbury recently, and, and I heard she was giving presentations out in uh, uh, New, uh, not New Lisk, Serpent River, there somewhere. There was a conference, and she was uh, giving some uh, uh, teachings about the language. And I imagine she was doing it in the language too, so. There are people out there that have done it successfully and I'm sure that if you take the time to, uh, and are serious about it, you can, you can learn. So I'm say we have a question from the ether, from someone yep. watching online. Uh -huh. So this is from Alexander. He's, he says that I read that there is a court based on indigenous practices in Canada. Can you tell me something about this? Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> we have uh, some courts that I can talk about. One I know about for sure, we were participated in that with the, uh, with the Elders Council uh, a year ago, that, and that's in, in uh, uh, Brantford. They have a talking circle, they have a sentencing circle that, they, uh, that they've incorporated in dealing with the matters that come before the courts with indigenous uh, uh, people. I won't say only men or women, but indigenous people. So they, they do that in a way that uh, uh, is culturally appropriate. They have elders sitting on the, in, in the courtroom. A number of them will sit in there to help with the, uh, I, both the translation and being able to understand what is being said on both sides and the uh, method of, of uh, uh, running or uh, uh, 
doing the, 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 the circle. They start with uh, introductions, of course, and they do smudging. They honor the uh, spirits. They ask Creator to come and sit with them to be uh, to to uh, uh, witness and help them and do this in a good way. So it's all done in in uh, in that way. And many of the teachings that that are that are given to the people in that area. And then in this case, I'm talking about Six Nations. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, uh, there's uh, many, well, there's many languages there, but they do, they're doing it in, the, in a cultural way that is appropriate, appropriate for them and for the people that are being presented in court. They may have the wampum there. They may have drums there. They may have uh, other uh, articles of sacred items that they use in their, in their, uh, in their, in, in their courts. In Thunder Bay, we were, uh, uh, we were taken there last year. IJD, the Indigenous Justice Division, our group of elders, we went there to witness a, uh, the operation or the, 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 the process of this uh, 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 sentencing circle, this court. It's an actual court. It's built in a, it's in a circle, four quadrants. There's one side for the defense, one side for, for the uh, prosecutors. Well, and then you have the elders sitting along there. Plus you have the family for the accused, family for the uh, 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 defense, well, uh, well, I guess we could say the, uh, uh, the one that's accused and the one and the victim use that uh, terminology. So they're, they're both there, and they each testify as to what transpired, as to why they got to where they are. And the court hears both sides of, the, of, the, of whatever it is that need to be discussed. And at the end of it, when, the, uh, when they've uh, uh, gone through all that needs to be done, the elders are taken aside, and they, in turn, can go to a separate room, and they can uh, talk amongst themselves what they think is the appropriate uh, type of sentencing that could be uh, given to the individual. So in, in my line of thinking, I think that that is one way that we can bring about a better sense of restorative justice. They need to uh, uh, have a chance to, uh, to, to be heard on both sides. I've gone to a couple cases where I helped this man uh, deal with the charges that he was being uh, presented with, and he did admit to having been, uh, uh, having done some of the, done the things that he, I won't say some, done the things that he was accused of, but then we talked and, and I told him that he needed to make sure that he understood what he was saying and what the, uh, what the result could uh, result in, what, what could happen. And he was very remorseful for what had happened. And of course, these things happened 20, 30 years prior. Now he's a, an older person. And this uh, young woman uh, was now in her mid-20s or 30s, too. And, but they resolved the case. And he uh, uh, eventually had to go for treatment for, for, for quite a long time. I recommended at that time that he go to a, a program that was run here in Toronto called Pidavin Lodge. And that was a good program. It was run uh, in a traditional way with the elders coming in and doing ceremonies. Uh, the counselors that were there were traditional people. They, they worked with the individual in doing ceremony in a way that uh, it's supposed to be done. Uh, we had elders come in from all over uh, 
Ontario, even from Quebec. We had uh, this elderly gentleman from uh, Quebec, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh. Anyway, he's from uh, 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 Quebec. I can't think it's that great matters. Um, <laughs> turning kind of slow today. <laughs> but anyway, he, he'd come down and he would do ceremonies. He would do uh, uh, sweat lodges. He would do teachings and he would do naming ceremonies and, and trying to help them in any way they could in, in trying to... Uh, William Kamanda was his name. So I'm sure many of you probably have met him. And he could speak five languages. Now that's really something. He, he was a... He was a really uh, um, important man uh, to the uh, to the people in that area, and not only there, to all of us. So that court system that they uh, have in Thunder Bay is uh, slowly evolving to other communities uh, throughout uh, uh, Ontario and in Canada, I suppose. Uh, in Sudbury, uh, one of my uh, 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 the elders that I'm with, her name is Donna, Donna Tabasagi. She also talks about the, uh, the uh, uh, process that they have on Manitoulin Island. And it's strictly a, uh, 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 a traditional uh, uh, indigenous court system that they have. They operate a, a sentencing circle there too and they listen and uh, uh, I guess you try cases, if that's the term they use, for people that come before them. And what she said, what they need now is to have something like that in Sudbury. Because Sudbury is, is a multicultural uh, uh, city where many, many uh, people from northern Ontario now congregate. They come because we have university there, University of Sudbury, Laurentian University, Cambria, and College Boreal, and, and whatever, different, uh, pro, uh, different forms of education. So they come there to, 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 for the education. So maybe now, uh, <coughs> with, <coughs> with the wise words from Donna, that people there will begin to uh, 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 the process of trying to uh, establish uh, uh, a native court sentencing circle or whatever that name is they're going to call it. I hope that happens in Sudbury real soon because that's where I'm at. Yes? Hi. Ani. Can you? Oh, there we go. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit about language in the court because one of the things I think you pointed out that was so important is that while there's been a lot of work put into creation of indigenous language words to describe ideas of the court, I haven't heard much about work within the court to understand indigenous worldviews and how that plays out in the language. Um, is there any effort or the idea of effort for court workers, lawyers who are involved in cases where indigenous languages are being used to understand that English doesn't translate directly, that they need to understand how to pose their questions in ways that can be translated without the, all of the work being done by the indigenous people to, to do that, to translate um, the English ideas when it's not being reciprocated, when they're not feeling that the court is putting the requests of community members because mm -hmm. hearing that you know you've been in cases where you weren't given enough context to properly translate and then you sat with that afterwards I'm I feel like you may have been carrying that for other people who had some responsibility to give the information required for proper translation I think this is one of the reasons why we have this gathering here is to try and come up with ways to address this particular situation that you, that you speak about. And yes, uh, it is difficult to try and translate 
some things that are spoken of from the English language and <clears throat> translated into the uh, indigenous language that uh, is being used in that court. Uh, all, uh, safe to say that it's not all Ojibwa uh, court. There's Cree, there's Oji Cree, there's different types of Six Nations uh, nations. So uh, yes, we, we do uh, uh, need to make sure that we can come up with a way to try and uh, help uh, uh, ameliorate the situation of that lack of understanding on both sides. And one of the things that uh, I see that's happening is, is that our people are making that effort to try and begin teaching that even in the early stages of, of uh, classroom settings, like in yours, for example, the type of uh, 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 curriculum you're, you're going to be able to use or, or could have been able to establish given the fact that uh, uh, the current government has put, uh, put a stop to that certain levels of curriculum. And that, to me, that is going to be a bit of a hindrance to further educating the young people and the non-native uh, speakers about the cultural ways and about the cultural language to 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 one another. And you yourself, as a, as a, as a, an instructor, know that you've already been through that, and what you have said is already what you know needs to be uh, 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 addressed. I know I've. I've sat with you for a number of years in, in the classroom and heard you speak about the, uh, um, uh, the inadequacies of, of what happens when people go to uh, court. Why didn't they have this? Why wasn't this happening? When I spoke with, uh, for example, when I spoke with uh, uh, His Honor uh, 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 Le Harry Le he talked about the Donald Marshall case. He spoke then of how important it was for the courts back then to have had an understanding of the cultural implications of where this man was coming from. And how it led to where he was being tried in court for, for, for something that he attested to and testified that he had not done. And it took, I don't know how many years, 20 some years or whatever, till he was finally exonerated of that. And they found out that he was in fact innocent of the charges that were laid back then. How many of those cases are we now uh, uh, going through that may end up in that way. We don't know. Maybe there's some little bit of cultural understanding that the the uh, the uh, defense would like to have or need to know, or the judge or whoever need to understand, so that they can get a better understanding of why and how come that happened, and the way it happened. Uh, we have some cases where uh, our people have gone to court for uh, uh, horrendous crimes. I'll give one example. These two young men committed uh, uh, murder in, in, uh, on Manitoulin Island. Some of you may rec remember that case. And it was culturally related to the beliefs of, of, the, of the individuals and of the people. In our belief, we have uh, uh, entities that we recognize. We have the Jemin de Do. We have the Great Spirit. We also have the other side, where we believe that people can and do practice bad medicine. Much like in this big book, there's the Christian way, there's a, the 
God, Jesus, or the, the Catholicism, what they teach you. Then on the other side, there's Lucifer's ways. So there's two there. Well, in this particular case, the, the, uh, the individuals did what they were told that they thought they needed to do that needed to happen. And they understood that it was the person that was doing that was operating, was doing so out of bad medicine, what they call bad medicine. And it was termed as bear walk. I don't know if any of you, uh, I'm looking at the gray hairs, maybe they'll know. <laughs> but anyway, it may even be in some of the, uh, the law books about that case. But uh, in the long run, it turned out that these two men were were eventually acquitted from this first degree charge, I guess it was, simply because the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the belief that there was a, 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 another entity that uh, uh, prompted them to commit this or in this act, and that was the Bear Walk. And if you go up north, uh, 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 in areas where uh, you've probably, some of you have been, you have in one, one side of the community, the communities here, on one side you have the Christian community, believe strongly in the Christian belief. Go to church, everything done in, in, in the, that Christian way. On the other side you have a community that's hanging on to a traditional way that they've had for thousands of years. Their parents, their grandparents, their great-great-grandparents taught them in that way until the time that these people came and took some of the kids away and brought them to this school elsewhere. Or the government came and took them away and put them in schools. Well, luckily enough, not luckily, I guess we, we uh, it was good to know that we had people that were uh, uh, strong in their belief, like the Medellin societies, kept their traditional way, belief, and everything. They may have <clears throat> uh, uh, hidden it for a period of time, away from from the uh, uh, from the from the government and from the churches so that they could preserve this, and they, they brought it out. And slowly, the people in, on this side are starting to take back what was taken from them. And I'm talking about the culture and the language. And I know for a fact that if you go up north and you go to the different uh, sessions of court that you're going to go to, you're going to, go on, you're going to come across this. You're going to come across the, the, uh, a setting in court where there is strong belief in this particular way of belief. And you also still have those that are still believing in, in the Christian way. I'm not going to run down any uh, spiritual belief because my grandfather once told me that when you get older, you're going to find that there are lots of ways that, uh, that people believe. And one of my uncles was sitting with us at that time, and he said, yeah, you've got people that learn, that speak, that attest to the Bible. Their God is God, Jesus, whatever the three, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Then you've got uh, other people that believe in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Allah, Buddha, and other uh, uh, spiritual beliefs. And he says, you know, they all pray to the one. For us, our belief is in strong in knowing that there is only one that we pray to, and that's Creator. However it is, we understand them. In AA, they have a saying that to pray to your greater power as you understand them. And I believe that's right. That 
if you believe in, in your greater power as to how you believe, then that's the route that you should follow, that you need to follow. But of course, then there's uh, conversion. People have been converted. Uh, I too, uh, in my earlier years, uh, went to uh, uh, went through Catholicism. In the school I went to, I learned to uh, uh, to become an altar boy. And for a number of years, I would get up at six o'clock every morning to help the priest to to uh, prepare for mass for that day. And sometimes in other days, there are religious ceremonies. Sometimes you would ask me if I could uh, be part of that. I don't know why me, but anyway, uh, uh, I did, uh, I did. And that was for ceremonies like benediction and uh, other ceremonies. Sometimes there was a uh, confirmation, sometimes there was a, a baptism. And I, I, I had to, to be there because, well, I had to because I was in that school and I told, was told I had to, had to be there. So for, for, <clears throat> for us, for me in particular, I speak to you with knowing and the belief that my greater power, I understand them as Gizemedido, knows what I'm saying and believe me, I telling you what I believe and why I understand when I say this with this feather in my hand. I could also use this because I, I know and respect the Bible for what it has, for what it teaches, and for what it's done. But I can't condemn everybody based on some individuals that have taken that and gone the other route. My, my teachings are from what my elders teach me. They tell me, You should learn to walk and live in a good way. Walk straight. Walk in that path. Like what we say in our, in our classes, in our teachings, I'm going to walk in a good and right way so that the people that are going to follow me are going to pick up what I've said and done in the proper way. That's what Bimak uh, way is all about. If you have had a chance, <laughs> if you have had a chance or if you haven't had a chance, I would encourage you to try and uh, participate in what we call Bimikoe. It's a session where you will have an experiential learning the whole day of what we went through from the time of contact right through to the present and what we see could happen in the future when all of these things can combine to make one good place to live, to have a better understanding of what we believe in, whether it's either the Christian way or the traditional way or whichever spirituality you believe in. You need that opportunity to express it. And my people need that opportunity to, to be able to bring back that importance of how we can translate and and and, uh, and educate you in in the uh, in the courtroom settings, and for you, my friend, I'd be happy to take you aside and and uh, teach you some words and language, uh, depending on the time that you have. But I also know other people and teachers that that are uh, less committed to other uh, other. Uh, places. For me, I'm being drawn in all directions. I retired when I was 65 from the school, uh, from Toronto District School Board. I worked all my life. I worked here in Toronto as an iron worker. 
I built some of these big buildings here in town. I became a teacher in 1985. I, I came, went back because of my daughter dying here in, in Grange Park, just not too far from Spadina Avenue. I became a, a, a teacher. I became a teacher because it was taught to me when I went to uh, my first fast as a young man that I, went, I was told that one day I was going to be a teacher. I didn't know that. I wanted to learn how to operate a big fire truck or be an engineer or something else. I even thought of one time being a conservation officer. I really liked that because I liked the animals. But after my great grandparents died and I was, my daughter died, I went to school and I learned how to teach. And that's exactly what I became that old lady I met up in the Seine River told me, she said, why are you here? In the language. I said, I'm here because I was told that I would one day be a teacher. And I guess that's what I'm learning, how to be a teacher here at Lakehead University. And that's where I learned how to develop curriculums, the classroom setting, and to enhance the language that I already knew. I still do that on a daily basis. I learn more and more every day. It's because of people like you asking questions, putting things to me, <coughs> so that this gray matter up here can try and uh, uh, absorb all that's being presented. Now that I'm 80 years old, I'm busier now than I was when I was 60 and 65. Just finished a session up in Sudbury, which we combined in one day. It was supposed to be a two-day event. Did, did that in one day. I'm here today. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Loud and clear. We got. Well, that's it for uh, for my part here, and I'm sorry that I may have gone on a little bit in different areas. If there is anything in particular that you want yourself, just I'm going to be here for a while yet, for a few minutes, I guess, do you want for to, an hour. Should yeah. I close? Or? And you can you can ask, and I'll do the best I can. And I guess we should close this session so that we can let the spirits wander out and do their work too, because they've got other places that they need to be. Same thing as us; we got other places to be. We got. Miguatsky Good thing, good now, Gavin Walk and Mr. Twat, Gawkadian, Gavin Walk. Go on to there on a go get go one, or not more, or for what, be we not a walk of the Schnabek. We snungo, Gavin's by a Gavin's a young man, Ungo, we snungo, we watch the go. We watch the examinator, we watch the dog beside it. We watch the girl, Miss Sargis, keep getting the go young man. Thank you. We give thanks to Creator for allowing the spirits to be with us. And I give thanks for you to, for being here to listen to what I did have to say, which wasn't really very much. Uh, my elder, Angus Pontiac, he, his name was Shkema. And I said, why do you call yourself that? Shkema is, uh, means like a great big body of water. And at the narrowest point of it, which may be two feet, that's the extent of his knowledge compared to what's out there. That's what his, his name, Shkema, meant. And I understand. I understand now that the little bit of uh, what I know is even smaller than what Shkema knows. Mine is that little tributary that's going into this little pond. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you so much for your time.